Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm James Milan, and I am here for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our current state rep, uh, Dave Rogers. He's the rep for the 24th Middlesex District, which includes portions of Arlington and Cambridge and all of Belmont. Dave, we've spoken many times before, but thanks for being here once again. Absolutely, James. Good to see you. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, first and foremost, uh, in my recollection, and I could well be wrong, is this the first time that you've uh, had a primary opponent in one of your elections or not? Well, actually, in the first election was an open seat. So Will Brownsberger had been elected to the state Senate, and uh, that created uh, an open seat. Um, and uh, those are often the most contested uh, mm -hmm. elections. Um, and uh, sure enough, there were initially five candidates in the Democratic primary. Eventually, two of them didn't move all the way forward. Uh, they started a campaign but stopped. Uh, three of us continued on. And then uh, uh, with a lot of help from a lot of people in the community uh, and a lot of folks really in Arlington, uh, I was able to uh, uh, be successful with that and um, and then I did have both an independent and a Republican in the general election that year and mm -hmm. uh, uh, again was able to uh, do okay those there. Open, those open seats will draw attention from all over the place right? Yeah that's right and um, you know uh, even the the independent a guy named Jim Gamel from uh, from uh, Belmont who's uh, uh, had worked actually in the Carter White House as a he he told me a story. We're we're pretty friendly now, actually, and and uh, you know our campaign was not overly contentious. But um, Jim told me the story that he uh, he went in 1975 to Georgia to work for an obscure Southern governor who not many people had ever heard of, Jimmy Carter, mm. <laughs> to work on his campaign. And uh, he Carter, you know, kind of caught lightning in a bottle and and won. And uh, at a, only in his 20s that uh, Jim had a pretty big job in the Carter White House. At, uh, but at any rate, yeah, so he was the independent. That, that certainly was a singular instance in American history. as Well, our lived history, that's for sure. Jimmy Carter's victory. Um, I should have clarified that I think this is your first uh, opponent, uh, you know, your first election as an incumbent in which you've got a primary opponent. That is correct. Um, and so I'm wondering um, whether you would share with us candidly, like what are the pluses as far as you're concerned, what are the pluses and minuses for having a challenger um, in the primary? Well, I believe in democracy. I believe deeply in our system and no one uh, has a claim or a right to an office. This is the way it works. And uh, I have to go out and explain my record and uh, my, uh, accomplishments and how I've been able to help our community. And uh, that's only fitting and proper. And uh, uh, fortunately, the feedback I'm getting um, in a pretty substantial way is, is uh, remarkable, I have to say. I think I, I pour a lot of myself into this work. Um, I give it my all. And I've gotten a lot of important results, both at state level policymaking, but also tending to the community, always showing up at community events. Uh, making sure to look out for our local interests in the state budget, kind of. Um, uh, so, um, and then almost sort of being a super volunteer. I mean, uh, through this pandemic, for instance, uh, delivering meals and masks to homebound residents, uh, um, personal protective equipment. Uh, Belmont Manor had a tragic outbreak of the virus, and uh, uh, we've all been learning and hearing about uh, the shortages of PPE, personal protective equipment, and I was able to really lobby the governor. It took a lot of work as the shortages. So uh, a lot went into that. We got them deliveries of critically needed uh, personal protective equipment. That's reflective of how I do the job. And I, um, so, you know, uh, I think, um, you know, four out of five members of the Arlington Select Board uh, have endorsed me, and the school committee members and um, town meeting members. And uh, I think that I, uh, I, I think that's a reflection of the level of dedication I, I bring to this work. So um, I'm very hopeful yeah, I mean, to continue on and um, continue just at the to recent, I'm sorry, don't mean to interrupt. No, it's fine. At the recent 
the debate we held uh, the other night and, and, you know, in our conversations previously, uh, it's clear that you are happy to and with reason stand, you know, by your record um, and, and the work that you have done. I, I am curious, I've been learning something um, through, through these uh, interviews recently um, about the kind of formation of your district, um, but also peculiar, something peculiar about Cambridge. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, your district encompasses a portion of Arlington and Cambridge and then all of Belmont. In Arlington, you share that with Sean Garbley. Okay, Arlington divided into two different, uh, or divided by two different uh, uh, districts. But Cambridge turns out five different districts, five different house districts take portions of Cambridge. Um, so I'm wondering how, how, if at all, does that affect the fact that you are representing only a small portion, relatively small portion of Cambridge um, versus all of Belmont and a decent portion of Arlington? What does that mean for your time and you know, again, what you can get done on behalf of Cambridge, given the fact that you've got four other reps who also are, uh, you know, speaking for other, other communities in Cambridge. Sure. Well, I think it's important for a representative to uh, attend all needs of every corner of the district. And I've always uh, done so uh, and did my level best to accomplish important goals for everyone. Uh, I take seriously my representation of really of every of every person I represent and every community I represent uh, you know it's done by population uh, each of us represents roughly 38 to 39,000 up to on the high it's a range up to in the 43 44,000 45,000 and it varies with population moving in and out um, there are some representatives in western Massachusetts who have 30 towns uh, in their district um, so, uh, but, you know, I have the three uh, and, um, you know, I, I really have done a lot for Cambridge. Uh, most recently uh, in the Ringe Towers there in Fresh Pond, uh, what we learned through surveys and study and, and talking to staff and residents is that about 20% of the people in the Ringe Towers have food insecurity. And um, so uh, what we set to work you know, what can we do about this? What can be done? And we were able to work with a local um, not-for-profit, Food for Free, a wonderful Cambridge not-for-profit. And we started a food bank right in the Ringe Towers. And that was um, initiated uh, by, by me. In other words, no, they didn't come to me and say, hey, Dave, what can you do? I uh, came up with the idea. And, and, and not single-handedly, and I came up with the idea, but then I worked with my staff, I worked with their outstanding sure. staff, I worked with the residents, it's a team effort. But the idea came from, from me in my office and we were able to, uh, success, took, took some work, but we've been able to successfully set up a food bank in a place that had 20% uh, food insecurity. So- um, was, that, was that done previous to the pandemic? It or? was, yes it was, it was done prior to the coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and how, how if, if, you know, I, I would assume that the pandemic has increased both the urgent need for that service and perhaps the demands on, uh, on, this, uh, on that service. Uh, what have you found um, in terms of that? Well, that's right. And uh, so um, there, there are rising levels of needs, uh, not only with food insecurity, but uh, housing stability. That's why we pass an eviction moratorium in the house so that people are safe and secure in their homes. Um, it's why we've taken all sorts of extraordinary measures right now uh, because like never before, um, uh, I, I found my uh, constituent work as opposed to high level policy work or working on the state budget or working on uh, big uh, le legislative initiatives, just being in the district and tending to uh, human needs um, uh, has never been like uh, this before. Um, the truth is, on balance, my district, um, though not Wellesley or Dover or Beacon Hill, it's not the wealthiest uh, district, it is on balance pretty comfortably middle class. And in 
normal times, uh, while I always get some requests, hey, Dave, can you help me with DUA, the Division of Unemployment Assistance? Can you help me with uh, food stamps? Or can you help me in a variety of different ways? And, and uh, the demands um, now have been intense, like never before. So, and uh, despite all the higher level policy stuff I've been working on, like police reform and climate change, um, both um, me and my staff, I've, I've direct, I have a small staff that helps me at the state house. I've said any kind of request for help with unemployment, help with food stamps, uh, you need that rockets to the top of the list, you know, and we put everything else aside to help those in need. Uh, and, and it's been a lot of it. I mean, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, people, hey, Dave, I've been on hold for uh, three hours with DUA, the Division of Unemployment Assistance, because there's, there's a huge backlog of, of cases. Course. You know, what can you do? Unfortunately, I have contacts, a legislative liaison for the DUA, and, and I can cut through the red tape. Sometimes just calling myself and saying, you know, it's Representative Dave Rogers. I, I'm having some problems uh, with some of my constituents getting their claims filed, and we were able to get a lot of, matter of fact, I just got an email today, thank you. Um, I was very frustrated and in significant need. Uh, thank you so much for uh, getting my claim resolved, and that person will begin to receive a check, I think, um, next week. So, um, you know, I have a background in economics and law, and I, I uh, work uh, diligently on a lot of pretty high-level policy issues. But uh, during this time, really all times, but during this time particularly, um, human needs come first. And so, and, uh, you know, as I always say, this is a time, if you're in public service, to step up. This is a time to... Um, take care of the people who've entrusted you to be of service. And that's why I do this work. And um, so it's, um, while it's a terribly uh, disruptive and, and a difficult time and a time of great uncertainty, uh, for people in my job, um, it, it also, in a way, is an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to earn our stripes, so to speak, and to, um, to help people. And it's... Um, I'm glad we've been able to do that. Yeah, and I, I do think, and, and, and I imagine we probably have touched on this before in previous conversations, especially uh, in the last few conversations that have taken place under the conditions of the pandemic. Um, but I, I would think, again, it might be odd to, to phrase it in this way, but it might be refreshing, in a sense, for you to have to emphasize your the constituent services part of your uh, of what it is that you do, um, because I would think that the payback for you, or at least the the, the feedback for you, is just more direct, um, probably more appreciative if you are able to effectively, you know. Uh, provide the services that they are asking for, you know, that you're getting, um, you're part of a feedback loop this way, which is different, just fundamentally different from the work that you're doing in the halls when you get to be in the halls of the state house, um, you know, which people don't see uh, on the whole, and the they only are going to be paying attention to the fruits of that, um, and that only happens every once in a while, right? Right, and uh, I think that's uh, well said. Um, uh, you know, this is, choose your adjective, uh, you know, uh, a period of upheaval, a period of uncertainty, a period of enormous difficulty uh, for, uh, for many families and individuals. And um, it is um, um, just, uh, if, if someone sat down with any of us four months ago or four and a half months ago and said, let me tell you what's about to happen, it, it would sound like a dystopian novel. I, I think most of us wouldn't even believe it, right? It's, it's, a, it's a bizarre, uh, basically unprecedented, or at least unprecedented, I know there was the, the flu of 1918, but unprecedented for anyone alive today uh, in living memory. And um, it, it is, uh, you know, change society in, in innumerable ways. And, and um, so it, to your point, it, it is gratifying and uh, to be able to help people. Um, because again, that's why it's called public service. And so I've been uh, 
never busier in this job, uh, never, um, never more demands. Uh, but you know, we're all busy. We're all experiencing uh, disruption and having to adapt and to adjust. So I I'm, I'm happy to just do my part, you know? And yeah. But speaking of doing your part, um, I think, People are always going to be curious. And again, we've spoken, touched on this before, but it's worth finding out again, how, how are you doing your work? How has your work been fundamentally affected? Um, and how do you see, and, and also, you know, lessons learned. What do you plan to bring as we return to normal? What do you plan to bring with you that, that was part of this experience and that you learned through it? and are going to find helpful for doing your job in the future. Sure. Well, I'll take the first part of that, which is, you know, how has my work changed essentially? And um, like most other jobs and, and workplaces right now, the state house has uh, undergone a significant transformation in the way we are doing the people's business. And that is to say, we are not physically present and meeting inside the state house. Staff are basically encouraged not to come in at all. Members are allowed to come in, and I have gone in periodically to the State House, but um, we passed a special set of rules so that we can vote from home, uh, just like we passed a law so that town meeting in Arlington and Belmont can vote remotely. Um, uh, Belmont took advantage of that and actually did the remote voting. I think Arlington just chose to have the town meeting at, at the high school on the field there, but. Um, just like we allow local uh, legislative bodies in town meeting to do that, we're voting from home. Now, um, legislating is very much an in-person kind of business because I might have an amendment and I want support from my colleagues. And so I literally walk around the floor of the house. I built a number of uh, very good relationships with my colleagues. Um, and uh, it's just, it'd be almost fully, hard to fully articulate, but in countless ways, being in person where we can share information, where I can talk to the clerk of the house about procedural things, where I can talk to the floor manager about things. And um, it, it's challenging to legislate from home, uh, but we've been able to do it. We've moved a pretty big agenda. We just did, as I'm sure you've been, you know, you know from our conversations, significant police reform uh, to address the systemic racism and, and uh, the horrific killing of George Floyd and, and countless other cases. Uh, we passed major police reform. We just passed a, a really a sweeping climate bill to get us to net zero by 2050. Uh, increases the renewable portfolio standard and uh, makes municipal light plants uh, have to meet the same rigorous requirements as other utilities and um, includes an environmental justice piece uh, we passed, as I said, the eviction moratorium so people are safe and secure in their homes. We passed protections for frontline healthcare workers. Uh, so, uh, um, and I won't go through the whole litany, many other things to help the Commonwealth weather the storm. Um, so, you know, we've been able to adapt and adjust like everyone else has to right now. And I'm glad um, we've been able to do that. As to the second part of what you said, what can I take? Um, uh, from this and, and that's such a great question because I've been talking about this a lot and all through my time of public service and even prior to serving I talk a lot about income inequality uh, the growing gap uh, the concentration of wealth in our country which is really it's not um, it's not an exaggeration to say statistically it's reached essentially the same level as the Gilded Age yep. the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and the Roosevelt's it I think the data is published by the Commerce Department but if you look at the data on national income, we are um, uh, really reaching that point. And um, people have talked about in income inequality for a long time, but this pandemic has revealed it glaringly, I think, in ways that has not been revealed before. So what animates me going forward, uh, and should I be fortunate to be reelected, what will drive me on a policy basis is uh, addressing the inequities uh, in our society. I've always worked on that. It's always been the centerpiece of the fight for 15. We have the highest minimum wage in this country. We now have paid family and medical leave. You know, at the federal level, as I said the other day, you have FMLA, that's Family Medical Leave Act, but that's job protected. So if you go out to care for yourself or a loved one, your job is safe, but you're not paid. Here in Massachusetts, right. we're one of the few states that has passed paid leave. Um, 
And so I've already filed bills that address this. For instance, we learned that big gig, Uber and Lyft, the big gig, so-called gig companies, they don't pay into the unemployment trust fund. So when the pandemic hit, all of these gig workers don't have adequate protection. I worked mm -hmm. with uh, Mike Firestone. He was the chief of staff for Maura Healy. I think he helped run Elizabeth Warren's campaign, then ran Maura Healy's campaign, became our chief of staff. He's since left. Um, but we collaborated to uh, draft legislation that would um, make big gig pay into the unemployment trust system, as they well should because we believe they're misclassifying these workers as independent contractors as a way to skirt their obligations. Um, and I filed several other bills on uh, protecting workers. I'm proud to have been endorsed by the AFL-CIO, SEIU, the Mass Teachers Association. Every major progressive statewide labor organization uh, has endorsed me in, in the race I'm in now because I've made uh, protecting working people and fighting uh, income inequality a centerpiece of my work, but but again, to your question, um, it it has to be, uh, I believe, what drives me and the rest of legislators, other senators and representatives too. Let's take this moment and learn from it and build from it. After the Great Depression came the New Deal. After the Gilded Age came the Progressive Era of reform. We 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 I I can't really state this strong enough how I feel about this. We have to take this moment. Uh, and learn from it and, and, and try to rectify these glaring inequities. And that's what's gonna be driving me. In, in addition, of course, always tending to my district and our local interest, but in terms of higher level policy, that's, that's my focus. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and, and, and there was a question about this in the debate, but I'd love to you know, have you elaborate a little bit more. One of those areas that you're talking about of existing inequity, I think, and then as we move forward, where where there are real vulnerable populations, is going to be around jobs, going to be around the jobs that have disappeared during this pandemic and that have been held by people who work very, very hard, but may not be able to see where their own future lies in some other kind of work. Um, what kind of uh, either message or ideas or potential even, you know, uh, programs. Uh, do you have in mind for uh, those very vulnerable sectors of our population? Yes, well, I, I mentioned that I filed a kind of a portfolio of legislation to protect workers. I filed another bill that I think is getting significant interest that would create a presumption if you acquire COVID uh, uh, you acquired it on the job and therefore, therefore qualify for workers' compensation, uh, meaning the workers' comp insurance company can't say, well, how do we know whether you acquired it on the job as a nurse or a doctor or another grocery, you know, maybe you got it somewhere else. No, there will be a presumption under the bill I, I drafted that you are entitled to your workers' comp. So I think now we, I've been filing legislation to protect workers uh, now to your, I think your, the larger point you're making, which is a good point, um, I still believe, uh, you know, we have one of the strongest regional economies, as I've said, not just in America, but really around the world. I mean, if you look at the Boston regional economy, uh, between our great university system, our amazing hospitals, where people come from all over the world to be treated at, at, at our hospitals, if you look at uh, the technology in Kendall Square. Kendall Square really now rivals Silicon Valley in a lot of ways. It's the second leading tech sector and in some areas has surpassed Silicon Valley, uh, particularly in biopharma. So uh, we but, have- But are you saying, I'm, I'm sorry, Dave, but does that mean that you're saying that those sectors will be able somehow to, uh, and they are very vibrant and robust, you're right, of course, are they going to be able to expand in order to, to, I mean, we're talking about people who are going to lose their jobs in, you know, in kitchens uh, and, okay. and servers in restaurants and things like that. How, again, how, how is the, the, the work of our vibrant sectors going to, uh, you know, be able to offer opportunity to folks like that? Sure. Well, I guess, look, we I don't want to downplay this incredible shock to our economy and, and, and uh, suffering 
and dislocation that's happening. Um, and I, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, I see that in my work as a representative and the people I've been able, been able to help. Um, so, um, but the, the key is, here's the truth, in, in my opinion at least. Uh, biopharmaceutical companies all around the world are working furiously on kind of two pieces to this. One is antivirals. Uh, that is to say, obviously when AIDS, HIV came along, another virus, at first it was lethal, and many people lost their lives tragically. But now if you uh, unfortunately are diagnosed, uh, there is a cocktail of drugs that you take and people are living basically full lives. A, a virus. Well, similarly, uh, companies all over the world are working on antiviral treatments for coronavirus so that if you get it, uh, you, you will survive and you won't end up on a ventilator. And, you know, so that's one thing. And then ultimately a vaccine. And that has to go through human trials. It has to be scaled and manufactured and distributed, as I say, at scale. And that's going to happen. Uh, no one can predict with certainty when, but it, it will happen. And um, uh, the truth is, until we have good antivirals and uh, a vaccine, there's going to be continuing disruption. And for, for workers and families now, that's why I'm fighting so hard for social safety net programs. Uh, you know, at the state house, we're doing everything we can in the budget to fully fund social services. That's why I'm filing legislation to protect workers so they can get workers comp. Um, and then um, we just passed an economic development bill with various incentives uh, to try to keep the economy strong. But the key, and, and um, I think some folks have been talking about this here, is um, what is going to happen with the federal government? And um, we we cannot run a deficit at the state level. State governments aren't allowed to do that. And um, we have to have a balanced budget. As you've probably been reading about, uh, at the federal level, the US House passed a bailout package for state and local government. But the Senate stymied it. Mitch McConnell, who I hope will be defeated this year in his race, and I hope we take back the Senate, and um, uh, has held it up. But I, a lot of people think, and I've talked to some members of Congress, that eventually the pressure from the red states, uh, you remember red state governors and red state mayors, they're facing the same uh, budget shortfalls, that we'll get a bailout package from the, um, uh, from the federal government. And we need it because we can't run a deficit. So um, in, in terms of jobs, the economy, um, you know, that's going to be key. Uh, because without it, we have about a $6 billion hole, we believe, in the state budget. You know, I, I, I wanted to give you earlier warning than this, but we've got only 30 seconds left at this point. The conversation okay. has flown by, as always. Anything that you wanted to, to add in here for the audience before we go? Well, it's just, it's an honor to represent Arlington and the rest of the district. I, um, as James, I always, as always, enjoy our conversations and, uh, uh, I will continue to stay motivated and focused on helping the people I represent and being fully engaged in this work. Well, we really do. I we understand how busy you are. and We do appreciate you taking so much time with us in this last week and in general. Um, I've been Thank talking one-on-one uh, -on -one with our current state representative, Dave Rogers, who is seeking re-election to the 24th Middlesex District and, or for the 24th Middlesex District. Uh, once again, Dave, thanks for joining us and thank, thank you. you in the audience. We hope that you have gotten something from the conversation as we have. I'm James Milan. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. <laughs>